Amen. Praise God, brother. I knew. We sorry about through. sorry about that. I'm. It's all good. Totally doing it the wrong way, and then I figured out. I said, "Oh, you're doing it the wrong way. You gotta." Yeah. It's gotta all good, it. man. And they're okay. Cool, man. Sweet, brother. Well, welcome. Called by Christ, brother. Welcome here. Thank you. Appreciate oh, it. So I guess we got to do this all over again. You know what's messed up? Because I had the music. We're not going to do all that. This is called by Christ. It's your story yeah. for God's glory. This week, we have a, a special guest, different from what I normally bring to the table. Usually, we're bringing priests or theologians, these people that are extremely involved in the church. This week, we've got somebody who's just as powerful, someone who's been transformed by the, by the power of of a strong will and the mercy and graces of God put together, both of them working one and one. So I just want to say Carlos Vasquez is who, who we have here today, my brother Carlos. He's a transform a full transformational entrepreneur, author, motivational speaker, life coach, whose journey from hardship to triumph is a testament to the power of resilience and perseverance. Forced to escape a toxic home at age 13, Carlos grappled with homelessness, addiction, gang life, culminating to a 20-year sentence, which he did 17 years of it. Man, that's 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 a lot of years. Three years of those was in solitary confinement by himself in a cell. Carlos turned these adverse experiences into the bedrock of his personal growth. And how I know him, we're just gonna, there's a lot more acolytes and things that I can talk about what he's doing. But let's just get down to it because it took me a little while to get on here. But I'll just tell you one thing about him. I've rubbed shoulders with him. We worship a little bit, bit together. I've seen who he is. He We've met at St. Peter and St. Paul Church in Altaloma, California. There's just something about him. There's this this fire inside of him that's different. Um, it, it happens when you've been healed, when you've been when you've been saved, when you've been transformed. It takes me back to this scripture before I give it to him. But Christ actually says about the tax collector and the Pharisee, because the tax collector asked for mercy, the Pharisee didn't. And when Jesus goes on to say, well, those who have been forgiven more, we have more to give. You know, when we understand that forgiveness and what we've done in the past, Carlos, Thank you for making this time out of your busy schedule. CEO, how to battle here in the house. Thank you, brother. Hey, thank you for the, the introduction. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'd like to say I'm um, honored to be here. You know, uh, I have a lot of respect for you and everything that you're doing. Um, and, you know, just grateful for the opportunity um, to just be here today, but also to be here and to be able to share, you know, some of my experiences with you and to the viewers and everybody out there um, who may need it. And so uh, thank you. Yeah. So is it, I don't, I'm not sure how many times you've been on before, but how many Catholic podcasts have you been on? None. This is the first one. Oh, man, yeah. brother, you know, you're <laughs> yeah. a strong brother. I broke shoulders yeah. with you. I connect with a lot of podcasters. I would love yeah. to just in the future, we'll talk about all that stuff later on. But I'm excited about. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me to be the first brother to yeah. uh, you know be able to interview and hear a story. So, yeah, let's just get into it. What do you want to tell us? Let's let's hear about you. You can whatever you want to go into about your story. Like we said, we got this is our first segment, so you don't got to try to rush everything. If yeah. you want to do the first part this hour, and the next month when you got time. Do another hour. We can do that. It doesn't have to be rushed. A testimony is something personal. There's intimate moments that happen in your life. We're willing to take that extra time to be able to listen to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll start here. Um, and because I, I, there's so many points in my life that I could start, but I'm going to start back when I was um, 12 years old. I think that it's it's because I lived such a different life than I went on to live after that, and then now that I'm living, and so it kind of like is a testament to anybody out there who has kids. You know, at the age of twelve, your kids are a certain way, but you never know where they're going to go. But a huge part of where they go is um, the way you parent, and I think you know that's when everything changed for me. And so um, when I was twelve, uh, my father he stopped coming home a lot. Um, before that, he was fully involved in my life. I went to Catholic school. Um, I got straight A's. I, I played baseball. And I didn't have a worry in the world. You know, my my family provided for me. And 
Um, I felt safe there at home. Um, but once my dad stopped coming home, you know, I stopped feeling as safe. I stopped, I started to question, you know, uh, why he wasn't coming home. And my mother, she couldn't really provide me an answer because I know she had a lot of things going on in her, her mind as well. Um, and I think that in, in our culture, which, which was our culture, like Latin culture, a lot of times we don't talk about stuff. We kind of hold things in and especially like parents, they, um, so they weren't very open about it. And so by the time I was 13, you know, my father was completely gone. I remember my mother sat me and my sister down at the table and told us that he wouldn't be coming home anymore. And we really didn't know why. We just all we knew was he wasn't coming home. And um, my mother, she went into a depression and she was forced to take on multiple jobs to provide for us. So the relationship my mother and I had, you know, kind of dissipated. Uh, my sister started to run the streets and she got pregnant when she was 16. Mm -hmm. Um, and then quickly, right after that, I started to feel like I no longer, you know, had a home. I no longer belonged there. And so, um, mm -hmm. I ran, I ran away from home at 13 and I ran away into the streets and, uh, I ended up in a very bad neighborhood, um, not too far from where we lived, but far enough to where, um, you know, I felt like I was in another world. So I ended up there, um, and that's where I first got introduced to the gang life. I first got introduced to drugs and alcohol. I first got introduced to like, like growing up in an environment where, you know, you have to survive, um, and do what you got to do. And I was 13. I remember I was sleeping in the mm -hmm. abandoned car, um, behind my friend's apartment complex. And every, every day his parents would go to work. I'd go in there and like shower and stuff and eat. And I was just sleeping there and I would run the streets the rest of the day. And, Right. So, um, by the time I was 14, I was fully involved. I was a gang member, fully involved in the gangs, uh, selling drugs, mm -hmm. um, addicted to drugs, you know, drinking all that stuff already at 14. And, um, you know, the male role models that I had then mm -hmm. were all, were all gang members. All, most of them had been to prison already or, um, jail. And so those became like my new father figures and I started to emulate them and, and do what they said to do and become like them. And, um, you know, I developed a warped mindset in the process and completely changed into another person than, than who I was. Um, and in the process of that, I met my best friend. Um, his name was Chris. Um, Chris mm -hmm. was, by the time I was about 16, Chris was, um, about 18 and he became like my big brother. He, protected me. He showed me how to survive. He showed me, um, how to make it in, in there. He taught me how to really fight and everything. And, um, you know, I ran the streets with him every day. And then, um, shortly after he, uh, I remember we were at a drug house and, uh, we went in there and he started to play Russian roulette with another guy in there. And, um, I remember he put two bullets in the gun, spun the cylinder and shot himself in the head. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he killed himself. Sorry about, about that. Word. Yeah, he killed himself uh, about about four feet from me. Um, and I remember when he did it, everything everything inside of me was telling him to was was wanting to tell him to stop, to not do it. And I didn't have the courage. I didn't have my own voice to do that. And I didn't want to seem like I was scared or it seemed like I wasn't down. Um, and you know, in retrospect, it kind of, it kind of is like why I'm so passionate now about like speaking up and speaking and, and saying what's on my heart, because, you know, that's something I can't ever take back that moment. Who knows if I would have said something would have happened, yeah. but that's why I do what I do now. Like I'm, I'm a speaker and I speak in front of a lot of people, but it's, I don't ever get comfortable with it. I'm always, I'm always facing my fears when I speak. And it's, it's because I live my life now um, so much about helping others that I overcome that fear by knowing that, hey, there might be somebody out there that needs to hear this, right? And, and I'm not going to not say it like I didn't say what I needed to say to Chris that day. And so that kind of drives me every day to continue to voice you know, what's in my heart. So, um, you know, he killed himself. And then, uh, shortly after that, I started to develop, uh, PTSD. I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but I started to have nightmares and I started to remember I became, I had like a lot of 
suicidal thoughts and violent thoughts. And I started to act on those violent thoughts. And um, I started to do violent crimes and became deeper involved in the gang life. And How old are you to, right now? How old are you right now about this age? Oh, at that time, I was about, yeah. about 17. Okay. Right, I was about yeah. 17. Yeah, I was about 17 mm -hmm. at that time. Um, Chris killed himself when I was about 16. So I was about 17 at that time, and I started to do armed robberies. Um, I used to rob banks, used to rob jewelry stores, and, and really... I was a full, full fledged, full fledged criminal. So I did everything that I could do, but robberies was like the thing. And um, I, in the, you know, I was seventeen, but I started my own gang at the time. I was already in the gang, but I started my own gang within the gang, and it was just like a crew of us that, you know, we would just rob. And so I went on a robbing spree, and, and eventually um, started. You know, one of the people got caught, and then my name came out, and I was wanted. And so uh, I went on the run for a year. I was about 18. I went on the run for that full year and um, the U.S. Marshals were looking for me and, and they finally caught me. Um, and I was 18 when they caught me and they um, arrested me. And I remember getting arrested and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the cop telling me that I'll never be free again. Um, and we just drove to the police station. And, and that's when I was in there fighting for my life for another year. Um I was facing life in prison because of my gang involvement. So they was giving me life for the gang enhancement and gun yeah. enhancement and the multiple strikes that they were giving me. So I was facing life all the way up until um, the day we were going to go to trial. And I remember um, something happened in the district attorney. You know, he, he, something happened. My lawyer told me that something happened and the district attorney wanted to offer me a deal for 20 years. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I ended up that You're day 19 it was like, right there. You're 19. Yeah. I was 19 at okay. the time and okay. I had already been, yeah. yeah, I'd been fighting my case for about a year and, um, yeah. And it, he offered me 20 years with two strikes and he was like, take it now. I remember I was in the courtroom. Nobody mm -hmm. was, nobody was there. Like, like, you know, it was there. I was there alone. And I took that deal for 20 years at 19 with two strikes. Oh. And, um, I remember telling my lawyer, I, cause I knew about prison and all that enough to know that like two strikes and, and that much time was almost like a life sentence because I mean, I know people that went into prison with two strikes and, and never got out because they went in there and did one thing and got struck out. Pick so it up in there, yeah. yeah, but I, I say, you know what, I, I have to take the chance on that. And I did. And so I took the deal. And, um, shortly after that, I was, uh, sent to prison, um, mm -hmm. sent to prison with that right there. Yeah. Um, so I got to prison. I was, uh, about 19 years old when I got to prison. I remember right off the bus, um, one of the older guys was like, look, you have this much time. You have this, you, you know, you're young, you got to go in there and you have to prove yourself. You have to, you may have had a reputation on the streets, but that's only going to take you so far in here. You got to go in there and prove yourself. So I already went in with a violent mindset. I already went in with a mindset to, you know, try to um, be tougher than I really was because that's survival in there. And so I did. And once he told me that it kind of reinforced it. So I went in with that mentality and, um, for the first t decade in prison, I was, I was that person. I would always try to get involved in things, um, sign up for things to uh, earn my name. Um, I quickly got involved in selling drugs in there, quickly got involved in criminal behavior in there and got deeper and deeper into that lifestyle in and out of the whole, um, getting into trouble um, for my first decade, and um, no I, God this whole time either. No God, no education. No. This whole time no. as we're going on. I remember we're yeah. thirteen years old. We're out. We're out on the streets. Yeah, we're yeah. we're going through things. We're getting mentorship from men who are on the streets that are giving us guidance. But this whole time, you, your family's on your. You're kind of like seeing the family every once in a while or something as you're going along right now on your path. So yeah, yeah. You, get that, get you get that time and now you're in prison. Are they communicating with you or? Um, you know, when I went into prison, I, I, I kind of lost touch with my family. Uh, mm -hmm. my first, my first decade in, I, okay. um, I felt that like, even though they would try to reach out to me sometimes and they would mm -hmm. want to like to find out what was going on. Um, I kind of got lost in there and I remember my mom <laughs> wrote me one time and she told me like, I feel like I'm losing you again, like deeper. I feel like I've lost you and I'm losing mm -hmm. you more. Um, because I remember 
I would, I kind of, the way that I dealt with that in there was just not even being in contact with people out in the world because it just hurt too much. And, um, I didn't have God in my life at that time, like to, to help me, you know, I didn't have God in there to, to ensure me that I was going to be okay. And that every, I didn't have that yet. So I was solely just off of the, just living in the flesh solely just, yeah. you yeah. know what I mean? Like, and so, um, and it's crazy when I think about it because I, I was so close to God when I went to Catholic school as a young kid, like a boy, mm -hmm. it was huge in my family. And then I just, when everything, when my dad left and I ran away, it just completely severed my relationship with God. And, but even through all that, like me walking, me disconnecting from God, it's like, he's still like, look, I mean, look at where I'm at today. Right. He still had mercy on me. And it, I think it's amazing yeah. that, um, and, and, and that's why a lot of reason why I do what I do so passionately is because I know I'm doing God's work. I truly feel like he put me here to do what I'm doing today and um, to fulfill these visions that I, that I have to help others. And so, you know, of course, I'm going to approach everything with everything I have. Right. Because God gave me another chance at life, because as you know, we grow up, go through prison and all this stuff. We mm -hmm. see so many people like don't make it so many people. Yeah whether they they get killed whether they don't make it out of prison whether whether they don't make it through the addictions whether they don't make mm -hmm. it um mentally you know they don't they're yeah. not ever the same and so through all that adversity and all that sure. that i dealt with for me to be able to make it out still you know intact still able to right. you know function the way i do i think it's just it's just it's lord. all god it's yeah it's the lord for sure it's like there's no other explanation and um but so yeah and so uh, first decade in, I was the same, and everything changed um, when I was uh, sent to um, to go to the shoe for three years, uh, so was, which is a security housing unit. I went to the shoe for three years, yeah. and I remember when I went back there, there were guys who'd been back there for twenty years, and I remember a lot of them said they came yeah. back there originally with a few years, a couple years, but they never let them out because you know once you're back there, you have to get cleared to get back out, and yeah. As long as you're an active gang member, and I had become a um, a shot caller in prison by then, so okay. and that was yeah, and so you know there was um, all kind of like documentation on me marks that, on you. You've already got some validation marks, exactly. So yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so I went back there, and I when I got back there, I was like, okay, I may never get out of here now. You know, I may be like some of these um, men back here who've been back there for for so long, and. And so that like really um, caused me to think and I had time mm -hmm. to really just analyze my life. And, and, and it was just um, thinking about how I ended up there, like how I got to that point in my life and all the people I hurt, all the things that I did, it just hit me. And, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I felt like um, that was it. I wanted to end my life and um, I didn't serve no purpose here. I was doing nothing but causing destruction and pain and hurt. Um, one of my young, um, homies at the time he wrote me a letter he had just recently got life he was like 16 and he he was in, he he recently got he was 16 when he committed his crime but he was about 18 when he wrote me and said he was on his way to prison with life and just talking about how much i influenced him and he wasn't saying it like in a way that he blamed me he was saying it like he was proud that i taught him everything i did so that he can go in prison and survive now and i knew at that point that i had destroyed his life because I taught him all the wrong things. And uh, he's still in prison to this day, doing life. And that like made me feel like, like, why am I here? You know, why am I here? I'm just hurting people. And so I wanted to end my life. And so um, I was gonna end my life when the opportunity came and, um, and you this know- This is Corcoran, you're in Corcoran Shoe at this time or you somewhere yeah. else? Yeah, I was Corcoran? in Corcoran, yeah. I was okay, in Corcoran. Just to let everybody out there too, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. The shoe, like he said, yeah. segregated housing unit. It's the hole. You are isolated from everybody else. You don't have physical contact with no other person. You're always every time you get out of your door, you're going to medical, you have handcuffs on you, you're chained up. And so that's what happened. Was he got in trouble? He was like he said, he was living that violent lifestyle, wasn't seeking God. Didn't even really want to acknowledge his family, even though they were trying to reach out. He was in a bad place. Thought he was doing a long time in prison. Twenty years they had sent this, sentenced him to, sentenced him to, and he was going into like defense mode. You become that. 
you become to defend yourself and to survive in this em environment, you become this sort of like a monster because you got to protect yourself and no one else is going to protect you. So please continue, my brother. Just want to let everybody know this is where he's at in this story. That's a segregated housing unit, isolation away from every, every other inmate. Go for it, bro. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and so, um, you know, I got to the point where I was ready to end my life. And I remember I wrote a letter to my mom um, just apologizing for all the pain I put her through and explaining explaining why it became too much for me to bear. Um, and I remember I put that letter in my property. So if they, you know, when they found me dead, that she would get it at some point. Um, and I remember um, I was, you know, sitting on my bunk and I was just really just looking down. I was looking down and, um, and just thinking and, and imagining like how I would do everything. And I remember, a, and that's a chaplain came to my cell and uh, it was a chaplain walking around back there. And he was like, you know, going from cell to cell, I think he was passing out cards or something. And he came by my cell and he, he called me over to the, to the door. And, you know, he, he spoke to me and he, and he gave me a Bible and he told me um, everything I needed to hear in that moment. And it was just words of encouragement. It was words of like, that he really felt that I had a purpose on here on this earth. And he didn't know me. He just, he just told me that, you know, God has a purpose for me. And he challenged me to figure out what that purpose was. And he said to start reading the Bible and, and to pray and to get back connected with God. And so um, that was really like what I needed because up to that point, Amen. I, had, I hadn't had anybody just come to me and say, you know, um, God is the way. Like God, God can get you out of this. God can, you know, redeem your life. God can make you happy again. God can bring you back to your mom. God can bring you back to freedom um god is an answer. And for him, yeah so for him to come into my life and then challenge me in the way that he did um and the way that he said it is like it, it 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 hit me so um i did and i opened up the bible i remember that night i opened up the bible and i started Amen. reading it and then yeah. I, I started praying and um and i remember like praying and reading the bible and it's like and in that moment, I felt like, like, okay, just continue doing this. I couldn't really, I didn't know where I was going to go with it. Just keep doing it. So every day I kept reading the Bible and every day um, I started praying and I started to reflect on my life. And then I started to read as much as I can. And I started to read books about human behavior and start to read books about self-help. And um, while I was reading the Bible and praying and working on myself and, and for years I did that. And then after, um, I remember I started to transform my way of thinking. That's when every, like I started to transform the way I thought of everything. And I started to, um, you know, have real faith that I can get out of that situation. And, and it was, it was, it was the faith that I had in God to help me, to give me the strength to do it. First of all, to give me the strength to do it and then show me how to do it and then help me sustain it. When I got out of solitary, like that belief, um, helped me get through that. And so, um, I got out of solitary confinement and, uh, went back to general population with that new mindset, with that changed way of thinking. And, um, I knew I, I, that was by my big test because I'm going back into that world and, um, and I'm not alone anymore. I can't be, you know, just, uh, uh you know, in my own cell, I'm about to go back into general population where now mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be amongst everybody else. And a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, remember me for the person I used to be. And so it was a true test of if I had really changed. It was the biggest test I ever faced in my life. And um, when I got out there, I knew a lot of people weren't happy about it. And so um, I got stabbed twice. Um, I remember I got stabbed twice by um, some, you know, the people who weren't too um, happy about my change. And, yeah. but, I also knew that after I got stabbed, even though, it, you know, the, the pain I went through and all that, it felt good to know that, like, even with that getting stabbed, I didn't feel like I wanted to retaliate anymore. I didn't feel like I wanted to divert back into that because that was a test to me. Like, you know, I was taught for since I was 13 to if somebody does something to you, you do something to them. Right. If somebody does something, especially in prison, you have to do something to them. Yeah. But I no longer felt that I needed to live by these rules. Like I felt it like, 
you know, that, that God was going to take care of me. And that if as long as I stayed the path and stayed the course, um, that I would be okay. And even if I didn't, I said, you know what, at the end of the day, they could bury me, the man that I ultimately am supposed to be on this earth. And I felt okay with that. And so, um, but yeah, God helped me through it. Uh, he helped me get through those, the stabbings and I, and I, I survived it and I made it through it. And shortly after I, I remember I went to the chapel and I asked, um, the chaplain and it's a different chaplain. I, I never saw that chaplain again. The one that came and spoke to me in solitary confinement. I never saw him again. Um, and I always tell people, you know, they say like, Hey, have you ever tried to get in contact with him? I was like, well, um, yeah. you know, God sent him to me. So, you know, he came into my life for that moment for a reason. And if I don't ever see him again, it's fine because, um, I know that he, he came to me and he did what he was supposed to do in God's eyes. Like he did God's work. And so I'm just trying to always be the chaplain for other people now. Yeah. I always think about that. Like that, you know, we had a brief encounter. And so everybody I can encounter in the world today, I always think about how the chaplain impacted me in that short period mm -hmm. of time. So Amen. I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing that. And, um, that's the way I pay it forward. Yeah. So, He's living through me now, um, you know, wherever he's at. But so I, I ended up. Yeah, and just real yeah. quick. Sorry. I just want to yeah. like, yeah. you know, it's like I, this change is going on in there. A lot of people don't realize like um, he was pretty much owned. So that's why he got stabbed is because they yeah. wanted him to be a vessel of destruction. Still, they wanted him to handle business, whether he was checking people, whether he was governing and being involved in politics, he didn't want any of that no more. Because what he had done, he's led him to a path of destruction. So now he's getting out of the hole, and that's why these men stabbed him because they believed like they owned his life. When you are in prison and you start doing things, with and you start getting support, you start supporting the certain prison politics and organizations that are in there. They believe they own you for life, and there's nothing you can do to get out of it. And they literally tried to kill him. That's why yeah. they stabbed him, but he wanted another path of life. And so that's leads him go. Keep on going, bro. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just want to kind of let them understand that when you're in prison, there is death, murder, stabbings, all kinds of beatings, all kinds of stuff that's going on inside of there. That and sort of so when he starts going through his transformation, just know this that he's doing it well, he's in there with all this going on, and he got stabbed twice. So, hey, thank you. Keep going, brother. I, I commend your transformation and your willingness to say no, even in the midst that you knew that was going to happen. It's not yeah. like you didn't know that was going to happen, but you were like, I want to change. And you right. knew it was going to happen, and you still stood up against it and didn't just run. And you got stabbed because you didn't. You stood up for what you believed was right. And I just want to commend you for that because you could have yeah. hightailed it out of there a lot sooner than that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, please. Um, you know, feel free to jump in. I know there's okay. certain, certain points that people may need to get more context to. And, yeah. um, definitely, uh, uh, you know, if any, I can help with any of that, please let me know. Um, oh, but yeah, I, I, I think that, um, like I remember when I was in prison, there was a guy I used to talk to every day and he was going home in like six months. And I remember, um, um, a couple of, of his friends, you know, when we used to go to, we used to go to this workshop class and, you know, and, and a vocational workshop class. And I remember he used to like during lunchtime, he would always be in the back making a knife. Um, he, you know, out of the metal back there and, and yeah, people, I go yeah, crazy people. yeah, you know, and that's in prison, you always hear about people making knives. And so it wasn't really a big deal, but I remember he was making the knife and he used to tell me about it. Like, oh, I got to go sharpen his knife and whatever. So he did that. I remember like two weeks later, um, his own people used it on him and, and murdered him and killed him. And he was about to go home in six months because uh, he, yeah, all, yeah, because he didn't deliver a message that came from somebody that was in charge. And so it just goes to show, I remember I used to go uh, see him go to visits all the time and he had got married and it just goes to show like the lifestyle in there that people are, are so brutal that they'll have you make your own knife that you're, they're going to kill you with. And, you yeah. know, don't don't even care that you're going home. Don't even care you have a family and a wife and none of that, and to kill you so senselessly for something. And I think that um, it just kind of it kind of shows you the way the lifestyle was in there. And for me, that's why getting stabbed was not a surprise. And um, yeah. I know that. 
but I was okay with that. I knew like I was I wasn't afraid to die at the time. I knew that at least if I die, I'm gonna die who I wanted to be, and not mm-hmm. like you said, um, owned by somebody else. And so, but thanks to God, I made it through. And um, yeah, and it, it's so crazy because after I made it through and I started to. Uh, I went to the chaplain and I asked him if I could do groups in there every Tuesday for an hour. They had a little slot. If I could start to do groups, um, Mm -hmm. I started to create, yeah, I started to create programs. um, And I wanted to bring guys in and do these programs in like a circle. And Mm so um, that's where I really first started doing coaching and and mentoring was in prison. I remember I built programs and and things that I learned when I was in the shoe and things that I uh, read about. And I, and I created programs so that we can get together and start to have these, um, these, these things for us to build. And, um, most, most of them were all lifers in there. And, and I remember, you know, my change really empowered a lot of other people to be interested about it. And that brought them in. And, Mm. and and I think in prisons, so many people in there want to change. They just don't have the strength to do it. And then they see somebody else do it who was once like living the life that they did or once so involved in that lifestyle because mm-hmm. you know i remember a lot of them on the yard that i was at was like remembered me from the old way when we were when i was doing stuff that was wrong and and then now they saw my new change way and that really like it, it inspired them to want to know what how i got to that point and so they came in there and started having breakthroughs and um mm-hmm. and a lot of them um like it's crazy because a lot of them today uh, lifers they're they're out and we still keep in touch yeah that's and, cool yeah and it's amazing when i see them free and i'm like okay we started in these groups and and now mm-hmm. look at us and so oh i did that and for four years i you know i did that and i finished high school um i went i got my college degree in psychology i became yeah, a men- yeah i became a mentor and i just just every day of my life i just built i uh, worked wow. and, i tried to become better um, continuing to, you know, keep my relationship with God. And I remember I used to write and talk to my mom and just always telling her like, you know, God is going to make everything okay. And I'm going to come home and just have faith and, and believe. And, 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 and I'm just showing her through my change that it's possible and, and that we, I will be free one day. And so, um, I wasn't even supposed to technically be home earliest 2024 and I'm got out in 2021. And so all this time I've been out is like a gift that I never thought I would have. Um, amen, amen. Yeah, a dream? Yeah. Are so, you in a dream? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, it's like um, only it, – it, 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 it's crazy because I've been out about two years, um, a little over two years. Okay. And I can't imagine, you know, still being in there and not like – being where i'm at today like the people i know and so much i've accomplished in just two years i can't imagine that but i know that's why i know that like god has something more in store for us more than what we even know and understand and comprehend and and that's why i every day i live in that like i I just know that god has me on this journey and it feels right and i'm doing everything that i feel he wants me to do and um i i just have so much faith i don't worry i don't i don't stress i don't yeah. not you know i don't dwell on the past i just go forward and so i got out of prison uh, four years after i got out of the shoe and and i got out of change man and i walked out of prison and i knew i didn't really know how i was going to start what i was going to do and none of that i just knew that i wanted to help people and i wanted to share my story and my message and my wisdom and knowledge and my experiences and, and so i got out and i just approached everything with the growth mindset that I could learn it. Um, and that's where how the battle came from. I remember looking on YouTube how to do everything. And yeah. I wanted, yeah. So I knew when I wanted to be an entrepreneur and start a business, a coaching business, a mentoring business. So I started to look into that and I saw that it was actually a growing industry. And um, so I knew, like, okay, I want somewhere where people can go to when they are battling through something, when they're battling yeah. through, you know, uh, addiction, when they're battling. To, um, their mindset, you know, their work yeah. mindset, their yeah. beliefs, like all these things. I wanted to be mm-hmm. able to create a business to help people overcome those challenges and adversities. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's where How to Battle started. And um, and I started speaking and building up on social media and, and speaking, speaking, and speaking for free everywhere, every chance I get, right. and getting my message out there. And in the process, 
Um, it's so crazy because the first place I spoke when I got out um, was at a Catholic church, and it was in um, La Cañada, and and it's because the first job I had ever in my life was with a nonprofit organization called Prep, which is um, a branch off of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, um, founded by a, a Catholic sister named Sister Mary Sean, who um, oh, Sister me, Mary Sean, yeah, yeah, she yeah, in yeah. The prisons, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she got yeah. me. She she actually took me back into prison with her to the prison that I uh, left. Yeah, three months uh, after I got out, and um, yeah, I've been going back in ever since. And she gave me my first job opportunity. She introduced me to um, all these Catholic churches that that she would go to. She would tell me to go up there and speak and share my message. And so I did. And then when I did it, I used to there used to be you know, a couple hundred people at the time in there. And after I spoke and shared my message. So many people would come up and just be like, here, call me. Or like, if you need anything here. And I started to meet people and like, and those people today are like my best friends. Like, yeah. all yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, but I put myself, um, on, you know, like I was speaking on the stage and in Catholic churches and, you know, Jesus behind me and, and I'm in this church and I'm like, God is telling me like, okay this is where I want you to tell your story. And I did. And, and that brought so many oh, great God. people to me. Yeah. Like, like everything I have today is because of the people. If it wasn't for the people that I met in these churches, I wouldn't be where I'm uh, at today. Uh, um, and so every amen, Catholic church. Bro. Yeah. Amen. Thank like, you for saying that. Yeah. That's good. Stuff yeah. Like yeah. God. Like, yep. And so the impact to, of that being in the church and influenced yeah. by people that are, Oh, it's beautiful community, man. Yeah. Going, man. Sorry. yeah, that's where I found my community when I first got out. I, I got out and I, I started over. I had no friends. I just only friends I had was I met at a prep, which is a, a it was only like six of us at the time in this small nonprofit where that used to correspond with men inside mm -hmm. um, and women too, and just correspond with them and have them do self help programs and go into the prisons and talk to them, and then you know going to churches. Uh, throughout LA to speak and then do um, our art show. And, and that opened up everything that opened up all the connections, all the people in my life that helped me build how to battle, that helped me to be able to speak more, to help me to um, find my best friends who have given, helped me get so many opportunities and, um, and yeah, I've been God. building. Yeah. And so for the past um, year and a half, because the first six months out was just trying to figure it all out and then finally yeah. get it, you know, and then, but for the past year and a half, um, I've just built and I've, and I've, you know, yeah. And, and that's where I'm at today. Um, you know, still working, still, still work in progress, still learning, but, st mm -hmm. but, but feeling really confident about the future and, and where I'm going. So, yeah. So tell me about that. I'm seeing right here. I like it. I like this acronym. I like, I like where you're going to, bro. Yeah. I just got to say, I commend you. I come across a lot of brothers who are getting out. Who have done this but it's like you came with a plan before you got out it's like you had plans you had aspirations and like you were preparing yourself because a lot of people say oh he's lucky it's what yeah. wasn't that you were lucky that you prepared yourself so when the opportunity made itself present you were able to leap right into it i can yeah. see that you know and i commend you in doing it in those last 10 years or last seven years right while you're yeah. in prison in the midst of it, all the turmoil that goes on in there, getting your focus on. And, you know, I like it. So did you adapt all the – because I, I facilitated groups while I was incarcerated too. So anybody out there who's watching who doesn't know, who hasn't seen my testimony, spent a lot of years of my life incarcerated too. So if that's why I can relate to him so much. He's speaking my, he's speaking my language and the power of God that miracles still happen in our church to this day. And Carlos is a living miracle that's not only – been saved and transformed and been given freedom from the imprisonment not just of bars and cells and concrete jungle but of his mind his spirit and his soul that was completely entrapped and he's given god a chance to move in his life and i just want to you know commend him for doing that for allowing god to and all the you know i gotta say like i give you props i know you're a motivational speaker and I, I i really i know you are like i've seen your stuff i watch your stuff and you really inspire but it's, I didn't know the other side of all this, how you really are complimenting God and, and the Mary Sean thing. Because Mary Sean, I see, I saw her when I was in yeah. prison. Amazing yeah. woman. She's still going. 
She's awesome. She's really awesome. And you know, it's it's awesome that we're having these connections because I feel like you know, I can relate to somebody. I'm gonna actually going to tell you about, a, um, I, I'll talk to you about it later, but they're having a retreat next weekend and it's for brothers all like me and you. It's a Catholic retreat. St. Dismas. I was invited to it. So I want to invite you and See if yeah. you can make it to it next weekend. So let's keep let's keep on going. So you're out here. Talk about I want to see this acronym, pr the price, yeah. five principles. I love this. I was reading it earlier. I was reading it earlier. It was interesting. Five principles to break the bonds of trauma and achieve personal success. And he says that this doctrine was born out of his struggles, has resonated. With a global audience since the release of his book in March of 2020. Man, book, whoa. See, like, I'm learning more stuff. He sent me this bio a little while ago. So <laughs> I get to learn that my brother's doing some yeah. big things. Thank you, Jesus, that he could take this broken vessel and make it like new. Like, better than new. Because that's what he does. He reshapes it, you know. We're broken. He reshapes and molds the clay. It says, selling thousands of copies worldwide and serving as a beacon of hope in schools and institutions. So, everybody out there, the book is called The Price. Five Principles to Break the Bonds of Trauma and Achieve Personal Success. Now, I'm going to get one. I, I have yeah. to get one now. If I have to order for you from somebody else, so tell me about it. Where did it come from? And also at the same time, were you facilitating groups in there? And now you've brought it out here to do it because I, at your starting zone right there, I just want to know if yeah. you started in there, the speaking and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And and no worries. Yeah. I'll get you a book. I, 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 when I see you, I'll bring you a okay, book cool. too. Right, um, <laughs> but no, you know, um, I've, I've always been a writer and, you know, I started when I was very young um, through all the stuff I told you, I've always written in some way, whether it's music and then maybe, and then going into poetry and then to playwriting and then screenplay writing and now um, a book. And um, I, I wrote that book for the young people that I was mentoring when I got out. And um, I always had the principles in my head and I used to share them with other people in prison, but I never wrote them. Um, never taught on them, but I just knew that that's what helped change my life and what I still use to this day. And But I wanted to put it in a book for the young people that I was mentoring and coaching at the schools I was working at. Um, and I want, and, and so that's what I wrote it for. And so I wrote it self-published last March. And, um, uh -huh. and it's crazy because I wrote it for them just to give them, like when I go do my workshops, just to have something to give them. And it ended up, um, I remember like a few teachers were like, well, we need to get this book and, um, and, and we need to buy sets of this book for our classes and, and distribute them to the students wow. and have them do book reports and all this. So I'm wow. like, okay. So they started that and then they had me go do an author's talk and book signing at another school. And it just really started to grow. And then it, it, it grew from there to uh, me speaking at foster group homes and them wanting me to create a workshop around these principles and then so I did that and I tied my story into it and, and that became one of my signature talks now, which is the price um, principles for success and success, personal success for me, how I define it is doing, sure. you know, what you were ultimately put on this earth to do. If you, if you mm. get to that point in your life, then, then, then that's success because everything else comes from that. Like people yeah. think that people think that money makes you successful, but I always say if, somebody took all your money away, what would you be worth? And that's true success. That's true value. And I think that when you're doing what you are authentically put on this earth to do, then you will be successful in every other area. You'll be happy. You'll be enthusiastic about life. You'll have money. You'll have all these things, but it's figuring out what that is and getting to that point and being strong enough to pursue that. Because some people know yeah. what that is, but they're just not strong enough to take the steps to it. And they don't have the faith to do that. And that's where there's so much comes into that. And so um, what are these workshops and the, and the stuff that I teach is about the principles and each um, and the price is an acronym for one uh, letter for each principle. And the first one is uh, purpose, just figuring out your why, right? Everything starts with the why. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and so that's the, the, the P is the purpose, because if you have a purpose behind what you're doing, then it's like, that's going to get you through the struggle. That's going to get you through, like for me, getting out of the shoe and changing my life, it started with 
just making it home to my mom. That was my purpose. That was the initial purpose. Okay. And yeah. then and then that grew. It became bigger than that. It became not just getting home to my mom, but now getting out and being able to impact people with my yeah. message. And and so yeah. your purpose grows and it builds and it changes and it adapts as you grow. And so, but always having that purpose is key to success because that is it's in your DNA. That whatever mm -hmm. it is, it's gonna get you moving. Yeah. Um, the second one is, is, is the, of the prices and R, which is the routine, creating the routine that is going to get you to where you want to get. So for me, every day opening my Bible and reading it was a part of my routine. Every yeah. day getting up, working on myself, those specific things I did was my routine. And that is how I changed. That's how I transformed my life. If you're not intentional about doing something every day, you're not going to get to the point where you want to get to. You have to do it every day, and it's consistency over time that's really going to bring yeah. that change. And that's the root, yeah. That's the routine, and then the I is finding something or somebody that inspires you. Because for me, like even now, like okay, in prison, it was hearing about people getting out of prison and becoming successful, which is what yeah, inspired yeah. me. That yeah. that inspired me to want to be able to to continue the course. I knew I can do it, um, and then now today, I, when I People that inspire me today are people that when I go to the gym and I see a guy or a girl in a wheelchair and they're in there working out, that inspires me. Um, when I go, when I see somebody walking down the street with one leg and they're smiling, that inspires me. I find inspiration through people who are dealing with adversity that are able yeah. to continue oh, to man. push on. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. and and inspiration is yeah, inspiration is different for everybody. Like yeah. you have to know what inspires you and then right. figure it out. And then every time you don't feel like Going forward, you got to just channel that. Whatever that is, it could be a it could be a song. It could be, um, you know, it could even be going to church. Maybe that inspires you to go into the week a certain way. You have to know what works for you, and you have to tap into that inspiration when you don't feel it because you're gonna have days when you feel like giving up when you're doing anything challenging and when you're trying to find out what it is you're ultimately put here to do because it's not gonna be easy and and, and so. That inspiration is key. And then um, I like, this. I like, yeah. oh, are you going to the next one? Yeah. Okay. Go I just want to say, like, I just want to say with the inspiration, yeah, because there's days people say, me, Eric, yeah. you're always at this church, you're always at this event, you're always at this event. And I'm just like, I just think about like Jesus died on the cross for me. Yeah. And it's like, it becomes this great inspiration for me. And then I go there, or I go to events that like, I'm kind of like, ah. Yeah. And then I go there and it's like, God totally speaks to me. Like I'm on fire. By the time I leave there, I'm like, yeah. cause I was inspired. I have to remember what Christ did for me. Cause he still carried his cross for both of us. Yeah. For all of us out there, you know, Christ bared that burden. He carried that cross even when he was beaten and bruised even when he didn't want to do it. And that's what inspires me. I looked at, I looked at Christ. And then like you were saying, I looked at brothers like you um, that are doing what you're doing. Um, and also coming from, you know, breaking barriers, man, and creating new yeah. paths, creating new paths and programs. You're creating a map, a blueprint for those who are going to come after you. You're setting the tone. You're doing it. You're first yourself setting the blueprint and letting it out. You're becoming an inspiration yourself. And I appreciate you for that, brother. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And especially for, you know, young people who, you know, these things can, um, the, these are things that they need to know, you know, and they need people to help them and they need people to guide them. So um, that's, that's a huge part of what I do is for them to be that, you know, that voice to them that I didn't have. Uh, I know how important that would have been for me. So um, yeah. And, and so the last two is, um, is, is confidence and education. And um, the confidence part is, uh, if, if you want to do anything in life, you have to be confident and people find yeah. confidence in different ways. Um, and, you know, for me, I always find confidence in stepping out of my comfort zone. Every time I do that, every time I speak to a lot of people, I step out of my comfort zone and I challenge myself and I push myself because I know that at the, when I get, when I get through with that, I'm going to be a little bit stronger. I'm going to be a little bit better. I'm going to be a little bit more confident to continue to do my work to continue to yeah. do my mission. Um, yeah. and, and, and that comes from doing that. It comes from stepping out of your comfort zone, but it also comes from just trying to be better than the person you were yesterday. Always yeah. competing, always just being in competition with yourself. Um, you like me, I always look back at the person I was two years ago when I first got out. I always reflect on that every day. And I look at where I'm at today and how much I've grown. Yeah. And to me, like I don't look at 
this guy, this guy, this girl on social media and compare myself to how far they are in their mission. Even if we have same, we have similar industries we're in. I don't look at that. I look at it like two years ago. I didn't even know how to build. I didn't even know how to start an email when yeah, I got out. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, and like so, seventeen right, years. Yeah, right. Yeah. So <laughs> I insp- I find the confidence in that because it makes me feel like okay, I've gotten this far in two years. So mm-hmm. imagine where I'll be in two more years, and that gives me confidence. Um, and and pe- everybody can do that. Okay. Every you know, it's just so many people compare themselves to other people, yeah. and that that's and that could be you know defeating if you know if you do that because you don't know that person's journey, you don't know what they. Yeah, endure. you're right. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last one is education. Just knowing that you need to be a lifelong learner. You need to cons- every day educate yourself, and, and yeah. it doesn't matter how you do it. However you do it. But you have to continue to learn. You have to continue yeah. to grow mentally, and so uh, if you uh, incorporate those five things into your life, um, I believe that's what that's what creates success in, in a person's life, and in the process, overcomes the trauma. I don't have nightmares anymore. I don't have those symptoms of PTSD anymore. I've never uh, sought help. I've never taken a pill, and it's just gone. And it's because of me and my relationship with God. And, but it's mm-hmm. also, you know, me incorporating these things in my life every day. Um, and it keeps my mind focused and it keeps my mind right to where I don't feel that anymore. So mm-hmm. um, that's the things that I share with people. No, that's awesome, man. I like how you say that. But like, like how you said, it's okay. It's my trust in God. Yeah. Completely. But like, I got to do my part too. Like you got to put one foot yeah. in front of the other. It reminds me of the scripture where it says like, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because you could have just got out and done part of what you were doing and you probably would have achieved. But no, you went above and beyond and God blessed you being in those places where you were at for you to become so successful, man. Like, I, dude, you got to put the work in too. everybody out there. Like God wants to give us gifts. But if you're not putting in the work yourself, we limit what God can do in our lives. And Brother Carlos here is a full testament of that. Of where he's at right now. Because if everybody doesn't know, CEO of How to Battle. So he's a motivational speaker. He's a life coach. He's a consultant. He's helping people to navigate life and achieve more. How to overcome battles mentally, spiritually, emotionally, financially, confidentially. Like he was just saying, we need confidence. We need to believe in ourselves for us to get through things. We can have all the faith we want in God. But if we don't believe that God can work through us, hey, we're going to struggle. We're never going to be able to overcome. Carlos is a prime testament of that. So what's the message you have for us? So wait, I'm sorry about that. So you explain to us right now price. I love it, actually. I dig it. I dig acronyms. I dig everything. You purpose, routine, inspiration, confidence, education, all key points. Because like I like the top one, purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's like the it's like the you know the horse the carrot you know yeah he yeah, has a exactly. carrot right here and he had a horse yeah. wants to eat that carrot that's his Every, purpose yeah. <laughs> yeah. everything starts with the why you know and yeah, yeah. that's at the top you know and then the I mean the routine you could start that today like you could literally start doing something right now and make that your part of your routine to get to where you want to get to um, and so those are the foundational pieces you know of it cool. all yeah. awesome. So I'm going to ask you a question. Mm-hmm. I lost my dad three years ago on November 10th. He's in a better place now. Sorry. Praise God. You know, while I was in prison, I lost him to stage four colon cancer. But he always struggled, man. Always. Like, he grew up like kind of like me and you, you know, in and out. Yeah. drugs, gangs. You can never get rid of it, though. You know, I started doing heroin at 17 years old and just... Just kept on doing heroin and crystal never got rid of it amazing person bro but it's awesome that i got you right here and i'm gonna ask you this question yeah do you talk to your father has there been a communication or is he still alive or still with us or what's going on because it's kind of like i heard there wasn't you guys weren't close and that was right. the last thing i heard and so just asking if there's any what's going on right there brother yeah um that was a huge one for me like I remember um, I forgave my father uh, when I was in the shoe. I, I, I you know, I, I talked to God and I forgave him, and I, because I started to read the Bible and I understood the importance of forgiveness and how you know you forgive um, others not for them but for you. And 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, so I did that and I sincerely meant it. I sincerely meant it. And, and so, um, after years and, and time went by, I got out, um, and I told myself, you know, when I get out, I tell myself, when I get out, I'm going to go make things right with my father and I'm going to go talk to him. So, uh, I did. And then I got out and I, and, and it's crazy. As soon as I got out, um, he, he was, he was diagnosed with, um, colon cancer. And I mm-hmm. remember, um, our, one of the first time intimate moments we had together, he was laying on his, this bed, getting ready to go to surgery to get it removed. And, um, I was there and I was the only one there. And, um, and it's not like he didn't have other people, but in that yeah. moment, it was just us two. Mm-hmm. And I was by his side. I remember he was laying down by his side and he like gave me this look like, um, like he was just proud. And for so much of my life, like all I wanted to ever hear was like, my parents tell me that they were proud of me and, uh, they did. And I got to hear that. Oh, so, cool, man. um, and so and, and and that feels better than anything. And yeah, so to, to, to have to have my dad, you know, um, he's not a very open person to where he's like, I'm proud of you, son. He, he's not right. like, he's very like, um, you know, just a, a, just a very hard guy, right? But he gave me that look and I knew what that meant. And so, um, and then he went and luckily he had a good surgery and he's, and he's fine now. Oh, cool. And, um, cool. and I, and I go see him like every couple weeks. Um, yeah. You know, well, I see him. Uh, we 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 see each other every couple of weeks, meaning like we spend time together. But yeah. um, I and you know he's just so busy, and I'm busy. But um, it's 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 like I feel like that's still something I'm like we're working that out. And it's like I said, it's been two years, but um, we're a lot. We're so we're close to where I can go to him. He can come to me, and we're like there's a respect there there's a forgiveness there there's a we've moved on there there's an understanding there but there's also a lot of unanswered questions and we uh, you know we'll get around to that i think that um that's coming so yeah yeah and i think you know at the same time i just think it gets to a point to where there is a lot of questions about a lot of things you know my dad was a drug addict my entire life so when my mom moved away my dad lived rigid my dad you know when I was around him, he was my role dog, you know, was like my best yeah. friend. And so, um, yeah, we, we just kind of like, he would tell me he was sorry. And I was like, I was in prison. I was just like, okay, like I get, we prayed with each other. He gave his life to yeah. the Lord. You know, he was confirming or I think he had his um communion and his um baptism, but he really did. He asked God for forgiveness and we would talk to each other for a few years. He always had money on his phone. Um, but you just learned like, there's just some things that just, yeah. You know, you love each other. We want to move forward. We want to create new memories. We want to, you know, it's just hurts or hurts things happen. You know, me and my dad used yeah. to brawl, do all kinds of drugs and gang banging and robbing people yeah. together, you know. So it's, uh, you know, it's yeah. like, I was going to be like, hey, pumps. It's just kind of like, it's like, you know what? I wish I would have had a different dad, but it also created who me and you were to yeah. be who we are right now in our lives right now so that we can give it back to other people. Like, that's how I kind of look at it. It's like, Bygones have to be bygones because bottom line is if I wouldn't have gone through the things that I had gone through and you, if we wouldn't have gone through the things that we've gone through, we wouldn't like have the the overcoming. We wouldn't have the zeal, the passion to want to help others who were going through the same things that we're going through if we wouldn't have gone through it. So it's kind of like I just kind of thought of it while I was in there was bygones be bygones, you know. I love yeah. you, Dad. You know, it's yeah. we. I didn't. We don't realize how much time we don't have with them until one yeah. day they're just saying bye, and that's the end of it. You know. Yeah. No, for yeah. sure. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that too. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for sharing. So, what's the message? I know you said you want to do an hour here, and so yeah. I just want to get one last bling. What you what you give people because I know you. Yeah. I see your love for God, but when you go and speak. I know yeah. you're a motivational speaker. So yeah. I want to like kind of, can we get just maybe a couple minutes of what you might say? What like just a couple, yeah. like of your, cause we have these certain like um, cliche lines that we use models. We use, if you want to throw some things at us, because I, I know, I know you do, bro. I, you're big on that. You're, you're an awesome yeah. individual. I'm just wondering if you'd give it that to us. And I want to respect your timing because there's still a lot more I'd like to talk about. But I want to respect yeah. your timing, the next appointment you have. And hopefully we can get back together and we'll have some kind of like special day for you. We're all call it 
had a battle day, and it'll yeah. just be that show we have. We'll just be dedicated to a show with you, brother, because we would love to have you back. Yeah, no, I, I would love to uh, come back. I, uh, I truly respect everything that you're doing. I respect your passion, and and like I've never uh, met anybody as passionate about the Lord. And I've I've met a lot of people um, that you know. It's just it's different. You know, you could feel it, and I'm sure everybody that listens to you and follows you knows that. And so that's 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 definitely your um, your gift, and and I commend you for continuing to fulfill that. Um, and create this platform for people to come on and share. Um, because um, I guess one of the messages I would end with is that one of the, the greatest gifts you could give anybody is um, exposure and, and exposing them, either exposing them to your wisdom, your knowledge, exposing them to something that they've never seen before. Um, I remember when we used to take the kids out that I used to, that I was coaching at the time, we would take them to, this lake um in marina del rey which is probably like 20 minutes from where they live and they've never even seen it they've never Beautiful. even yeah they they've hardly ever been to the beach they just stuck in this box um that they live in and so um when you're out there and when you're you know around people and you have an opportunity to expose people especially young people do it expose them to your knowledge and to your wisdom and to your understanding of things and to books that help change your life into, you know, scriptures, into prayer, into whatever it is, um, expose people to that because that's the greatest gift you can give them. And people never forget that. Um, and so I would say that. And I would also say that, um, you know, to continue to lead by example, I think that um, a lot of people use that, but a lot of people don't, don't really live by it. And I mean that everything you do, all day, every day, whatever it is, even if nobody's looking, you yeah, want to yeah. um, do the right thing because mm-hmm. eventually when you do that, even when you know you don't have to, it just becomes regular to you. Mm-hmm. And then people, people start to see it and feel it. Yeah. And then, and then when that time comes and that person comes to you for something, some advice or some help, they're going to respect your advice and help because they respect you as a person. And so, um, because a lot of notice, a lot of young people, they don't respect a lot of older people because um of the life that of the things that they do in life and the way that they live but if people are going to respect you if you do the right thing and they're going to listen to you and so you'll be able to you get your message across um so to do that and you know always um trying to improve always you know working to become better um and to be uh, the person that if you were 15 or if you were 16 that you would look up to right um be the person that you res- that you respect like the people that we respect and that we look up to become that person work toward becoming that person if you're not mm-hmm. already there and that's mm-hmm. what i try to do is i always like say when i look at myself in the mirror and i'm like am i somebody that i would respect am i you know um am i somebody that that god is proud of um to be down here doing his work mm-hmm. you know can god um i know i always think like you know, if, if God took a day off, um, would he, would I be one of the people in his life that he didn't worry to continue to do his work? Right. Like, um, yeah. And so, um, and, and I want to be there. Like I want to be, you know, I have a new life now. I have an opportunity to live, um, a second chance and yeah. not many people get that. And so I don't take that for mm-hmm. granted. So be grateful every day. Um, acknowledge your the things to be grateful for the things that you may take for granted and not even notice um just being able to walk up and walk in wake up in the morning and walk that's something to be grateful for and you acknowledge those things and the people in your life you'll be a lot happier and and you know you'll bring a lot of, of better people into your life because of that happiness so um all these things i i you know i just i, I try to get people to 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 get into that mindset to do that because those are the things that I do and that help me to change and um you know our story our life of, of the past um is is the proof that you know one can overcome adversity and be happy and and not only that but do good in this world so um yeah I just hope that you know through my speaking and through you know my work that I can help people and that's it and I think that when you approach life like really trying to help people 
and do good, um, that's when you become successful. It's like it's, they're the most successful people in the world, I believe, are the ones that, and maybe we don't see them because they don't have like all this stuff that most people put out there. But mm-hmm. they're ha- internally they're successful, right? They're they're internally there's their success, and that's more important than anything. And so, in order to get to that point, you just have to really be authentic about what you're doing, and, and that's what I do in, in in my work. So, awesome, yeah. man. Yeah. Dude, you're amazing. I just, you know, I just, I don't want to even speak to any too much on that. I want everybody to resonate what he just said, being grateful, everything else he was sharing with us. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let's do an Our Father together. Okay. Our Father. Father. Who art in heaven. Father be thy name. Thy kingdom kingdom come. come. Thy will will be done. done. On earth. On earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this this day. day. Our daily, our daily bread. bread. Forgive us of our trespasses. Our trespasses. As, as, we as we forgive those, those who trespass against, against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver, but deliver us from us evil. Once with Hail Mary. Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace. grace. The Lord is with thee. Lord with thee. Blessed art thou amongst Lord women, Lord. and blessed is the Lord. fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Yes. Holy Mary, okay. Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners. Yes. Now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is called Amen. by Christ. If you go to at how to battle on YouTube, on Instagram, TikTok too, right? Yeah. How to how so it's at how to battle. You can find him and the words of encouragement and the speaking that he does. So please, brother, I just want to tell you thank you one more time. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. This is called by Christ. His story for God's glory. The truth shall set you free and the spirit shall set you loose. God bless. All right. God bless. All right, brother. Thanks, All brother. Right. All right. Thank you.